Thank you, Chair Plummer, Vice Chair Hillier, Ranking Member Golanski, esteemed committee, hardworking legislative staff. Thank you for allowing me to testify in opposition to Senate Joint Resolution, Resolution 2. I'm the Executive Director of the League of Women Voters of Ohio, and I'm here on behalf of Ohio voters as well as our dues-paying members who live in all but four Ohio House districts. Um, Ohio's long tradition of direct democracy has been enshrined in the Constitution since 1912, and indeed some of the best policies in Ohio have been passed for and by the people through constitutional ballot initiatives, including bond issues. The Ohio Constitution has a provision in it since 1851 that sets a 750,000 debt limit, which means that HJR1, SJR2 would in fact be applied to bond issues, and that's a problem because bonds have built Ohio. If the 60% threshold stood, the 2005 bond for jobs, infrastructure, and economic growth would not have passed, which had allowed local governments to repair roads, bridges, and sewer lines. The bond in 2000 for environmental conservation would not have passed, which invested in hiking and bike trails, brownfield remediation, and local watershed restoration. The 1990 and the 1982 bonds for low-cost housing would not have passed. One created low-interest home loans, and the other allowed local governments to provide rental assistance. Governor Taft's third frontier program that was designed to help bring Ohio's economy and job sector into the 21st century would have been at risk of not passing, and this is one of the reasons that former Governor Bob Taft and three other former governors former governors have expressed their opposition. Also at risk would have been the 1993 bond that was used to preserve Ohio's natural areas as well as promote health and safety through flood control, pollution prevention, and water quality improvements. These bonds created jobs, made Ohio a better place to recreate and call home, and spurred tourism and economic development. But more importantly, if they had not passed, we would have seen more competition for how to spend local and state government dollars. The state budget would likely have been larger, and taxes would likely be higher. But it's not just bonds. If you are truly concerned about protecting the Constitution, I humbly remind you that issue two on November 2015th, on the November 2015th ballot, passed by just 51%. That measure protects the Ohio Constitution from corporate interest by prohibiting quote, a monopoly, oligopoly, or cartel, unquote, from using the constitutional initiative process, quote, for their exclusive financial benefit. So let's talk about protecting the Constitution, because we at the League fully support such a lofty goal. We know that you are getting a lot of pressure from special interests who want you to rewrite the rules and abandon Ohio's proud tradition of direct democracy. Please tell those special interests, like billionaire Richard Ulean from Illinois, that our Constitution is not for sale. I'm also here to ask you to do the right thing by Ohio taxpayers, not just by rejecting SJR2, HJR1, but rejecting an August special election. In his 1967 inaugural address as governor of California, the late uh, Ronald Reagan said, quote, government is the people's business, and every man, woman, and child becomes a shareholder with the first penny of tax paid, unquote. Each of you have sat in countless hearings and meetings with constituents and key st stakeholders about the financial needs in Ohio during this budgeting process. You know better than anyone how great the competition is for Ohio's tax dollars. Roads, bridges, public transportation, clean water, local government support, education, services for seniors, people with disabilities, um, economic development, and so much more. Even if you support HJR1 and SJR2, an August special is irresponsible. It's bad government. I ask you to be good stewards of Ohio's tax dollars by rejecting an August special and to apply that $20 million to other needs. Even within the election space, there are far better uses like modernizing uh, voter registration, um, improving voter education, and increasing poll worker pay. The League is honored to stand in coalition with organi organizations representing Ohioans from all walks of life in opposition to this threat to direct democracy. In December, I had the honor of delivering a coalition letter to the General Assembly with 150 organizational signers. Last week, I personally distributed to this committee that same letter with 225 signers. Today, I'm here to tell you it's 240 organizations standing strong in opposition to HJR1 and SJR2, and it continues to 
to grow. Um, and many others have raised their voices through their own communications. Police officers and firefighters, election, uh, I'm sorry, electricians, construction workers, and nurses, faith leaders, civil rights groups, farmers, and teachers, good government organizations, former governors, former AGs, Republicans, Democrats, and independents. So many stand firmly in opposition to SJR2. In August 1946, during his service as Army Chief of Staff, Dwight D. Eisen Dwight D. Eisenhower, my dad's favorite president, addressed Brazil's Constituent Assembly saying this, quote, democracy is essentially a political system that recognizes the equality of humans before the law. The equality of humans before the law. Our commitment to equality in this nation and in this great state clearly must extend to voting. We must ensure that every vote counts equally. SJR 2 is a brazen attack on that simple principle of one person, one vote, and we ask you to stop it. Thank you. Thanks, Jen, for your testimony. Representative Stewart, do you have a question, please? Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you for your testimony. You brought up the issue quite thoroughly on bonds, and I, I appreciate it because now I get the chance to actually answer a question that our friends on the other side were pretty adamant about making sure I couldn't answer when I gave sponsored testimony. We kept getting interrupted to make sure I couldn't give these stats, so I want to make sure they're, they're part of the record. For the last 15 years, every bond issue in the state of Ohio that's been done by a constitutional amendment has passed with over 60 percent of the vote. In 2008, clean Ohio bonds were passed with 69 percent of the vote. 2009, veteran bonds were passed with 72 percent of the vote. In 2010, the third frontier program was renewed with 61% of the vote. In 2014, a public works uh, bond program was passed with 65% of the vote. So with that being the case, and for 15 years, Ohioans have never voted against a bond issue at the constitutional level. Why are you in here sort of fear-mongering over 1990 bond issues when we've passed every bond issue for the last 15 years with over 60% of the vote. Why, you've testified twice. Why do you leave that part out? Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Rep. Stewart. Well, I mean, I think it's interesting that you only go back 15 years, because you can go to 2005, and the Jobs and Economic Growth and Infrastructure uh, Bond would have only passed by 54% of the vote. And by the way, that, those investments went in each of your districts. Each of your districts has something that was funded by bonds that would not have passed. And so we, you, you're looking, you're specifically picking a couple years. That's why I went back farther because, and in fact, like some of those, I'm, I'm, I would love to see some of your, um, I don't have the 2009 here at all in my list of bond issues. So um, I pulled this from the state, but what I'll say is this, if this were such a great proposal would we have so many former AGs and governors of both political parties coming out in opposition? Would you have 240 organizations and growing come out in opposition? Would you need a million dollars from an out-of-state mega donor billionaire? You wouldn't. Thank you. Rep Stewart for a follow-up. Yes, Mr. Chairman, thank you. The, are you familiar with the process for amending the League of Women Voters bylaws? Yes. Do you know what that threshold is? 50%. Well, it's not what it says on the internet. Uh, the which, actual... I'm sorry, I'm sorry, Rep. Plummer, Chair Plummer. Which League of Women Voters? The National, the National League of Women Voters Amendment Article 15. Uh, I'll read it for you, it's on their website. These bylaws may be amended at any convention by a two-thirds vote, provided that the proposed amendment was submitted three months prior. I guess my question is, that is the sort of governing document for the League of Women Voters. Doesn't that, A, why not require 51% for your own constitution? And B, doesn't that suggest that, that your national organization has come to the conclusion that governing documents should be subject to something higher than 50% plus one? Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Rep. Stewart. I work for the Ohio League of Women Voters. It takes a simple majority 
to adjust our bylaws. So that's number one. Number two, something that might be different than a lot of organizations is that we are truly grassroots. When I say that we have members across the state, I mean it. We have in every congressional district, every Senate district, and almost every Ohio House district. Um, we, every two years, on, through a simple majority, vote on bylaws changes, our budget, who will be on our board, what our strategic policies are, um, what our priorities are, and that's all done. Um, and, and in fact, members can even bring their own issues. So yes, the board sets the issues that are gonna be voted on at our convention, but our members can have caucuses and bring their own issues to be voted on, and those are all passed by simple majority. Um, if you wanna talk about yeah. LWVUS, Sure, we can, but the bottom line is actually the members together voted on that, and that's a very, an organization is a very different entity than running the state of Ohio, and we have had the same policy since 1912. There's no reason to rig this game. Follow, Mr. Chairman. Rep. Stewart, follow. I, I would like to talk about a little bit about your national organization. I mean, you're clearly under the same umbrella. I assume you participate in the national convention to some degree. Um, why not? A. Did they get it wrong then? And B. Why not require just a simple majority to amend the bylaws of the National League of Women Voters? Doesn't that suggest that they believe a higher threshold is important when you're talking about the governing document as opposed to just day-to-day -day procedures. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Rep. Stewart. Bottom line, the League of Women Voters nationally and at the state level uh, supports simple majorities when it comes to government for and by the people. The way an organization runs is different. I understand it's really hard to defend this, and so the best way to do that is to try to attack groups like the League, but it's not going to work. So you could, you know, let's just fast forward to you passing this and we being on a, facing down an August election. The arguments are on our side. The voters are not going to be duped. They're going to vote no. Representative Geralds for a question for our witness. You say what? Uh, Representative Geralds for a question for our witness. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. I uh, just wanted to make sure I heard that right. Thank you. Um, thank you, Jen, so much for being here today. Um, you know, I have, uh, we've spent a lot of time hearing um, proponents, opponents on both HJR1 and SJR2. And, you know, I have to tell you, when I first took office in 2021, I remember putting my hand on a Bible and I read the uh, oath, which is one of the lines to support the Constitution of State in the United States in the Constitution of the State of Ohio. And that doctrine has been in place for 100 plus years. It did not say, change it at will. It did not say, change it when I want to. It was, my job was to protect the Constitution of the United States and the Constitution of the State of Ohio. And so I'm not gonna ask you a question about democracy, because I think we're past that. I am gonna ask you a question about tyranny and what do you think in your brain as you think about the process we are under we're talking about what is the opposition of democracy and in my head is tyranny but i would love to hear your perspective of where we are in this moment um i would love to just hear your perspective thank you thank you rep Gerald. thank you mr chair um <laughs> well, it was quite a question but let me say this um it's not, rigging, it's not rigging the game. In fact, there were some kiddos um, out in the hallway and I asked them, I just got a simple question to ask you guys. You're on a field trip, just a simple question. If we were all playing kickball and your team got six and my team got four, who wins? And they're all like, duh, the team that got six. This is just simple math. Even kids understand it. We all understand it. There's absolutely no need to enshrine uh, a, a majority rule here in Ohio. And at some point, you might be on, those of you who are, who are really wanting to vote yes, 
at some point, you may really want something, or your children or grandchildren may really want something to pass that won't go for 60%. This is bigger than this second in this hearing room. This is bigger than the August election. This is bigger than 2024. This is what kind of state do we want to be? And do you, on your watch, want to take something away that we've had since 1912? Because rest assured that if this passes, it does take citizen initiatives away from the people. It doesn't take it away from big money groups. It takes it away from the people. And I'm, I'm just gonna ask if that is who you want to be, and if that's the kind of Ohio you want for your children and your grandchildren, or maybe when folks in office are doing something exactly different than what you want, you're not gonna be here anymore to change the rules back to being fair. Rep Sweeney, question for our witness, please. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, uh, Jen, for being with us today. My first question is, um, within the League of Women Voters Organization, do you see swells of millions, hundreds of millions of dollars in dark money influencing the um, opinions of those who vote within the bylaws? Thank you so much, Rep. Sweeney. Thank you, Rep. Plummer. Boy, it, you know, I would, if I met an out-of-state billionaire, Maybe I'd, maybe I'd become influenced by them, but that's not how our bylaws work, right? Our bylaws are, that's a whole nother piece to our bylaws, um, is that when changes are made, they have to get sent out to all local leagues. Like, so at the, at the federal level, they have to get sent out to all state leagues and local leagues well in advance. There's actually correspondence back and forth. Um, a lot of research is done before they're voted on. The same thing happens in the Ohio League. Um, so before we take any sort of stance or make any sort of change, and in fact, it's happening right now for our June convention, all kinds of materials are going out to our local league leaders and all of our members um, for discussion and question and input. Um, our board will then take those um, questions and that input and respond to those questions, sometimes even have special calls before we get to um, vote on that. But there are, there's no dark money that's part of that. It's, it's, it's simply everyday people who have um, paid their dues, who are there to kind of debate how our organization runs. Follow up. Thank you, Chair. Thank you for the answer. It seems like a pretty apples to tree uh, comparison. <laughs> but um, the, my question is, I know you deal a lot in terms of election integrity and you know, just a nonpartisan organization that cares about everyone's ability to be able to cast you know, the freedom to cast a ballot if they so choose. And I know um, there's another committee, but it's related to this, that's looking at having this on the special election. And, you know, I believe, you know, I was made aware that there's election officials that are calling into question that if this were to go forward in August, that it not only would yet again with this General Assembly be forcing our, um, election officials, Republican and Democrats, to an unnecessary election that are already overworked, but they're calling to question that this has forced the integrity of not only the August election, but also the November election, because there are only so many individuals, there's only so many hours in the day, there are certain deadlines that need to be made in order to make sure, which should be the number one thing in this body, is to make sure that every single vote is counted and cast, and so we know and we have confidence in our elections. What does your organization have to say about the concern about rushing this process and truly about if you know we care about the integrity of our elections, we surely wouldn't put forward an August uh, special election. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank, thank you, Rep. Sweeney. Um, yeah, these two are inextricably linked, right? We have to talk about the August at the same time that we talk about this. Um, and bottom line, we are firmly opposed to having an August special election for this. That was the one piece of 458 that we agreed with was this concept of limiting August special elections because they are really expensive. We do have low turnout. And it is absolutely true that we're talking about elections officials who have been going through the ringer since St. Patrick's Day 2020. And they have not had a break. 
and they've they've lived through a pandemic, an extended uh, an extended primary, um, a very challenging 2020 election, all kinds of threats, um, records requests, and we are seeing a lot of turnover of elections officials, um, and that's a concern and a and turnover of staff. If we have an August election right now, we probably will see more of that. Um, and, and that's unfortunate because elections are, are, are very complicated processes and you are right. They are, they are, there's lots of time frames you know, that have to be met. There's calendars of things that have to be done. And at the same time that they will be wrapping up an August special, they'll have to be doing all of that for the fall. Um, and so at some point we need to respect our county elections officials. We have to understand that we've, they've been through a lot and they are great patriots and great servants um, as are our poll workers. And, and that is why we are opposed and, and that is why the Ohio Association of Elections officials has testified in opposition to the special election as well. Leader Russo for a question. Fire witness, please. Uh, thank you, Chair. Thank you, Ms. Miller, uh, for being here again to testify against this. You know, I want to sort of uh, keep going with uh, Representative Sweeney's line of questions. And we have heard from the uh, elections officials uh, that they are firmly opposed to this. And you sort of laid out uh, what they have been through. But I do want to go back uh, to last August. We had a special election. Uh, essentially statewide because all, every single one of our districts uh, for the uh, primary, um, we, we got a bonus primary in that August election, um, right on the heels of a May primary for everybody else, and then had the November election that followed. Can you just remind this committee some of the challenges uh, that were experienced in that August special election that are likely to repeat themselves again if this moves forward and goes to the ballot in August. Thank you, Rep. Russo. Thank you, Chair Plummer. Um, so actually, I think that the challenges would be greater. And the reason is because uh, the uh, boards of elections did not start, you know, a lot of times they'll let their normal polling locations know of a possible August election date, and they didn't do that. So I actually think we would have more problems. We have problems getting poll workers. We have problems making sure voters know that there's an election. The August election, you're right, was 8% turnout. Boy, I hope that we don't, we're not so folly to put such an important issue before the people of Ohio and have less than 10% of voters vote on that in August. Um, but it, in, in some counties, it costs more than what the state actually provided. So um, in that way, it's an unfunded mandate. But there's a lot of different issues. But first and foremost, we're going to have a problem getting spaces for elections. Um, follow up, please. Follow up question, please. Uh, so another question for you, and I think you pointed out in, towards the end of your testimony, you know, as we've been here for both the companion legislation of HR1, although we didn't get to hear from all opponents uh, in that round, uh, but we've heard uh, today and looked at the submitted testimony. I mean, I am just really struck by the wide range of opposition to this. Uh, you pointed out former Republican and Democrat governors, attorney generals. Uh, we've got elections officials who've come out against this. We have uh, labor groups that have come out against this, both public sector, teachers, uh, for example. We've had uh, the building trades uh, and a wide range of those groups come out against this. A number of organizations, you've got your coalition of close to 240 organizations organizations, police, fire. I, I mean, really, you know, when I look at who is opposed to this, it looks a lot like the people of Ohio. Um, and on the other side of this, uh, we essentially have what I've heard from three groups, Ohio Right to Life, Buckeye Firearms, and I put the Sports Alliance uh, together with them. Uh, so I guess technically they're two, um, so we'll count it as four. Uh, the Ohio Restaurant Association and then an out-of-state uh, mega donor um, who didn't actually submit public testimony but instead is pumping money into people's districts right now running ads uh, television and radio ads in people's districts um, influencing them to vote yes for this so I guess my question for you again 
is that at the end of the day, is this effort really about eliminating special interest or is it about silencing Ohio voters and a right that they have had for well over a hundred years? Thank you, Rep. Rousseau. Thank you, Mr. Chair. If this passes, it will do the opposite of what is claimed. So this is not a good government proposal. I work for a good government group, and I have the honor to do so every day. Um, if this passes, this does not take money out of politics. It pours more money into politics. It's pouring money into the politics right now, um, as we see special interests are the ones behind this. But it also will mean that only really deep-pocketed groups with lots of dark money are going to be the only groups that can get on the ballot. And, and that's why you see such wide opposition. This is a group, that 240 organizations, there's so much we don't agree on. But I tell you what, we are already planning on how we would run our Vote No campaign. And, we're, and that is because this is too important. SJR2 is fundamentally an Ohio. And we will knock on every door that we need to to win, if, if need be. Representative Stewart. 